Hi, it's a beautiful winter day in the Champlain Valley and I'm excited to be out in the woods with all of you. Uh, we're going to do some exploring and our topic today is um, reading the forested landscape. We're actually going to look at the landscape not like you're looking down at it like a map, but like we're slicing through it like the layers of the cake and really think about the geology of the Champlain Valley, the glacial history, and how the deposits that were left behind influence what grows above there today and even how people have settled. So we're taking a hike. Um, we're at Rock Point in Burlington and this is a great place to start the story that I want to call Rocky, Sandy, and Wet. Um, as we look across gradients of landscape in the, la in the Champlain Valley. So let's start with a story about rocks. Um, where have the rocks come from in Vermont and certainly very specifically in the Champlain Valley? And the answer is I'm standing on the rumpled bottom of an ancient ocean. And that ancient ocean was in the tropics. And if you look across at the Adirondacks, those rocks are much older than Vermont bedrock. So those rocks were the core of the North American continent and we were situated at the equator. So when the, the, the continents closed, creating the Champlain Thrust Fault and other features in Vermont, um, they rumpled up that bottom of the ocean and it has a lot of richness to it, calcium from shells, fish, and um, coral reefs. And so we're standing on that and it really influences the life around us. One of the challenging things I find about studying geology is the, the vastness of the time that's involved. And so I want to give you a little visual to understand um, sort of the relative age of some of the things I'll be talking about. So here's the lifespan of the Earth, 4.3-ish billion years old. And for most of that time, we know virtually nothing about what went on. That evidence has all been recycled and lost. Um, so the Adirondack Mountains, um, the base of them uh, was the Green Greenville Mountains and they are 1.3 um, billion years old. Um, the Iapetus Ocean uh, that surrounded them it started about 700 million years ago and the, the oldest of the, well, the oldest of, the, of the, those sediments that are now Vermont bedrock started about 500 million years ago. And later we're going to talk about the Ice Age and that's just at the tip of my fingers. So that gives us a little sense of the scale of time of what's got on and how much older the rocks are across the lake than the ones that we're standing on. One fascinating thing about the Adirondack Mountains is the rocks are really old. They're, they're you know, 1.3 million years old plus or minus, um, but the mountains are much, much younger, you know, a hundred million years maybe. Old rock is rising into these young mountains, um, and that's going on right now. They're still rising. We're walking through a limestone bluff cedar pine forest here on the rocky uh, cliffside of Rock Point, and the totem tree, so limestone bluff cedar, um, there are both kinds of cedar here, but the white cedar is really the totem tree of these rocky landscapes near the headlands of Lake Champlain. It's a very rare natural community. It occurs really in a tight band along the, the ridge here. How has it done so well in these environments and what are its challenges? The challenge here is, is super shallow soils, but they're rich, so they're not really nutrient limited, but they can dry out. So the cedars strategy is to be patient. These are very slow growing trees. They're deeply rooted in place. Um, they're just a network of roots grafting them to other cedars and other trees possibly. Um, and they uh, grow so slowly that they can live up to 1600 years. Um, they're really old northern white cedar up in, in Canada, north of here. They grow along the, the Champlain Thrust Fault here, so they're also found all the way from Niquette Bay th through Rock Point down to Red Rocks and Kingsland Bay. So go out and visit your closest limestone bluff cedar pine forest and you'll see how beautiful these trees are um, and gnarly and how much personality they have.
So we just heard a, a raven fly over, and they, they love these rocky cliffs. They're an, a, a, an animal that will visit and nest um, here in Burlington on these cl waterfront cliffs. And the other thing that being near the water, a challenge that it creates for cedar, is that they get ice loading. Another reason they need those strong roots is that I've been in cedar um, groves where you can walk between them like you're in an ice cave in the winter and the winds can be quite strong. So that ability to, to grip on is so critical for them. So we're, we've left the rocky headlands of uh, Lake Champlain and we're, we're walking down onto another major feature in Chittenden County. There are actually two of them. They're deltas from the glacial Winooski River one of them formed in the Richmond Jericho Underhill area. It's the orange on this map. And that was when Lake Vermont stood at about 600 feet above sea level. Then as that rapidly drained and the Champlain Sea filled this basin at about 300 feet above sea level, this other lime green delta built out into the, the Champlain Sea. It was built into the sea by the Winooski River. And we're about to head down to this side at the beach, and later we'll be at Sunny Hollow in Colchester, but you get a sense of the massiveness of this delta. Winter tends to really simplify the landscapes, and in particular, the herbaceous plants die back, and so we're out here today and we'll be seeing and focusing on a lot of trees and it's fun to learn trees in winter because they're the things that stand forth and proclaim themselves to you. But on the other hand, things are missing from the landscape this time of year. And I just want to let you know that on these naturally occurring sand beaches near a fresh water body, are, are, there are globally rare plants here in Burlington um, because it's just a very unusual habitat. When the water drops, uh, these annuals will come up and um, try to make hay while the sun shines. There are also some rare plants on this beach, including beach pea and beach heather, and on another sandy beach in Burlington, Champlain beach grass, that are holdovers from when this was the Champlain Sea. They've actually been able to cling to this landscape as this body of water has gone from salt back to fresh, and they are still here living with us in Vermont. This is what the inside of a delta looks like. Uh, you can see that it looks almost like rock right now. It's frozen, but there are layers in it where as the river brought the sand into the Champlain Sea, it would lay them down uh, in, in layers so that things are stacked up in this landscape. Uh, after this landslide, I'm leaning on a tree that used to be up even with the top of this cliff, but this whole section just slid downhill in the spring of 2011 when there were a series of rain events that really raised the level of Lake Champlain. So this is a newly exposed cliff right after that bank swallows and kingfishers started nesting in it. Um, so. But what I want you to understand is that these kind of deep sands underlie these sand plain forests that we're about to go visit. And you can see these deep sands along the Winooski River. It's cutting down through them, you know, as you paddle down toward the mouth of the river as it goes into Lake Champlain. Unlike the bedrock that we just looked at, these sands do not have nutrients in them. They um, are just kind of inert and life itself tends to acidify soils. So over time, sandy soils will become more acidic. And also they're thirsty. Water runs right through them. So they tend to be dry. So let's go look and see what impact that has on what grows above it. We've left the beautiful shores of Lake Champlain and we're now in Colchester and we're at Sunny Hollow Nature Park. And it is a natural area that is um, part of this larger Champlain Forest, Champlain Sea Delta, 
story that we're telling. So there, there are deep sands that underlie our feet here. And what's really interesting to me partly about this fo forest um, is that it has these very incised um, swales in it. So it has nice ridges and then deeper swales. And you really get a sense, if you can imagine this at a small scale, of how sand interacts with water on a beach. So the sand erodes very easily. And then when it hits those clay sediments that were laid down in the still waters of Lake Vermont and the Champlain Sea, when it hits those sediments, um, it doesn't erode the clay nearly as easily, so it tends to just cut headward. So these teeny tiny streams are making these fairly deep valleys out in this landscape. We're standing in a dry pine oak heath sand plain forest, so let's decode that a little bit. Dry, the sands just are thirsty. They drink up the moisture in no time, especially in the summer. Um, pine. There are a multitude of pines out here, but the one that to me is iconic for this landscape is the pitch pine. And I'm standing next to one. Um, oak we'll look at later. Heaths are the blueberries and, and things in that family. So they're the shrub layer in this landscape. And uh, sand plain, we're on top of a delta. We're on a sandy plain of soil here in the landscape. Um, so let's look at this pitch pine. One thing that's it's similar to my eye, the bark, to red pine, but it looks like a brick layer came and laid chunks of bark down. You know, they're, they're cracked um, vertically and horizontally. And this makes it very well adapted to one of the processes out here, which is fire. You have a dry landscape, you have um, wood on the ground. Um, this is a place that can easily burn, unlike um, the wetland that we'll visit later. Um, so uh, let's look at one of the adaptations to fire that pitch pine has is that it can send out new branches um, from its trunk. So it has epicormic buds. It can send out adventitious shoots. So if it burns and it loses some of its canopy, it can re-sprout, um, which is not uh, a thing that many trees can do. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing I want to tell you is that it has uh, needles and bundles of three. So that is a way to tell it apart. And we'll go look in a minute and compare and contrast it to a couple of other pines so you can start to get an eye for how to recognize the species. If you're finding pitch pine, you're in a dry place. So I was standing again by a pitch pine and the closest thing to it visually is a red pine. And as we look up through the canopy, we can see that the pitch pine to me feels like it has more negative space. You can see more through the needles to the sky. As we pan over to the red pine, you can see that those needles are all in bundles at the end of the branch. Red has needles in bundles of two. Pitch has needles in bundles of three. And I try to remember that as like, baseball pitching, three strikes and you're out. So that's one way to remember it. But once you start to get a feel for these two trees, their bark and their, um, and how they look in the canopy, they're easy to tell apart. They are both fire adapted, pitch pine more so. Red pine does really only occur in stands when it's either been planted or if there's been a fire because both of these trees need mineral soil to germinate. Um, they just can't make it down through the duff layer. We've talked about how uh, pitch pine needs bare mineral soil to regenerate and, and, and these sandy soils are really good for them. And so if you did want to see young pitch pine, there's a place in Burlington called Star Farm Park. And there where the landscape was plowed and windblown and the sand was exposed until probably the 1960s, um, there is now a young, regenerating, dry pine, oak, heath, sand plain forest. As we continued out, this is this ring finger trail here in uh, Sunny Hollow, and we drop off the northern nose of this sandy ridge, it immediately shifts to hemlock forest. It's one of the most dramatic natural community shifts that one can ever notice. So come here, take a look at that. The hemlocks are well adapted to shade and so they've colonized this slope and because it's north facing there's very little sunlight there 
and they just outcompete the other trees. So the oak part of dry pine oak heath sampling forest, I'm standing between them. Uh, here's a red oak, here's a black oak. The black oak to me almost feels like you took bits of bark and just stuck them on there like Legos. And the, the red oak, uh, a little more furrowed and you can see red down inside the furrows. Both of these trees are very well adapted to these dry, slightly acidic, um, sandy soils. So we're, we're looking here at um, the reason this is called pitch pine. It has nothing to do with baseball. It actually has to do with the fact that when this tree is wounded, it will send out sap. And it turns out that sap is highly flammable. So it may be that not only does it coexist with fire, but it actually encourages fire. And uh, these wisdoms that trees have with their surrounding landscape um, are just mind-boggling, just how they've adapted to where they live. I'd like to pause to acknowledge that we are walking over the unceded land of the Abenaki people um, this land was never deeded over to European settlers, and um, it's, a, it's, it's important in, a, in this particular story today, it's important for many reasons, but it's important because um, there's clear evidence that the Abenaki people coexisted with fire. Um, they, weren't, uh, they were even encouraging it in places. It's particularly clear that some native cultures were using it in southern New England to encourage uh, the growth of oaks. Right now, the only thing coming up in the, in the understory that's a pine is white pine. So this forest is transitioning to something else. It's, I, I feel sad um, that we're losing this natural community. We've come up, down off the rocky high points of the Champlain Valley. We've worked our way through the Winooski River Delta into the Champlain Sea, and now we're down into the clay soils, and we're in the floodplain forest. This is a silver maple ostrich fern floodplain forest. It's a little higher and drier than the silver maple sensitive fern floodplain forest, but both of them are clearly adapted to flooding. Uh, it's a dynamic environment. And the silver maple are the large trees that are around me, but the ostrich fern plays a key role. It helps anchor the soils in place, and often it reproduces vegetatively, so they're, they're often the same individual, really, in large patches. And what we find is if those become over-harvested, and that is a challenge because they are delicious, and we don't always know collectively how many have been gathered before we arrive at a place, um, but people managing these Winooski River uh, floodplains don't want people harvesting fiddlehead ferns because there's just no way to be sure what's sustainable. And once they die back and, and once they disappear from the landscape, invasive plants come in and they're just not as well suited. And we'd like all of these landscapes, we'd like to help them go forward in a healthy state into whatever comes next in, in the future that we collectively are creating. You might think, looking at this cottonwood, that it's bigger and older than the cedars we saw earlier. But in fact, these trees grow very quickly, um, and they tend to turn over more quickly. They're, they die younger than the northern white cedar. And it's sort of part of adapting to an environment that's constantly changing. When the ice breaks up in the Winooski River and it floods down through this part of the valley, um, those ice uh, rafts will jam up against the tree. So one key to surviving in this environment is to have really thick bark. I and mean, this cottonwood has that, and that's one of the ways that it persists in this landscape. We've come across the tracks of a cottontail rabbit, and it reminds me to pause and just share with you how much I love tracking down in these floodplain forests. Um, it's one of the few places in Burlington that over the last 20 years we've repeatedly seen bobcat tracks as they move down along the river. Also otters and mink and beaver love these wetland habitats and it's great for amphibians like frogs. So floodplain forests are a great place to go if you want to encounter track and sign of wildlife.
We're standing in Arms Forest and, and here's where we're going to end our hike looking at rocky, sandy and wet landscapes in the Champlain Valley. I love Arms Forest. Um, it's one of the most biologically diverse, just the richest landscape in Burlington and perhaps in Chittenden County. Uh, we have a ton of if spring ephemeral wildflowers that will bloom out here and just a great variety of trees. And part of the reason is that I can walk from rocky outcrops through a sandy delta down into a wet wild stream bed in less than five minutes. So all of the forces that we've been looking at, all of the processes are in play here at Arms Forest and it just gives rise to such a diversity of life. Thank you for joining us on another of our series of Vermont Master Naturalist Hikes. I've loved exploring the, the rocky, sandy, and wet landscapes of the Champlain Valley with you today. I encourage you to go out and, and meet your own forests. Get to know what natural communities are around you. Uh, where are things living? What are they up to? It's a great way to spend time. Also, I want to give a special thanks to people who are working on behalf of the wilds, both here in Vermont and elsewhere in the world.